Welcome to this first series of Melt and Pour. If you like this video and find the information valuable, please consider subscribing to the channel. The topics we will be looking into are making our own mold, making our own base, different types of colorants, fragrance versus essential oils, price range, different uses of melt and pour, melting techniques used, enhancements, packaging, and melt and pour frosting. So why melt and pour? Melt and pour was made popular by the company Stevenson's, who was the first to create a melt and pour soap base using certified sustainable palm oil in 2013. Melt and pour is a fun, inexpensive, and easy way to get started making soap. It is also rich in glycerin, has excellent foaming, it is extremely versatile and safe to use, which means you don't handle the lye directly as this has already been done for you. Unless, of course, you are making your own base, which is what we will be doing later in this course. Now we look at the advantages and disadvantages when working with melt and pour. First of all, it is affordable. There are a variety of pre-made bases you can purchase depending on your needs. And because it is so fun to work with and so safe to use, this is the go-to option for many aspiring soap makers. However, there are a few downsides when you compare melt and pour with cold process soap. When left exposed, melt and pour will lose its moisture over time, causing the soap to slightly shrink in size, and also, tiny drops of water can appear on your soap depending on the humidity of the environment. Glycerin is a humectant. In soap bases, it is a natural byproduct of saponification, but sometimes can also be added as a moisturizing agent. Humectants attract or absorb moisture from the air. Glycerin in soap attracts the moisture from the air which then forms on the surface of the soaps. This is also known as sweating. The more humid the environment, the more likely the glycerin will attract moisture onto the surface of your soaps. In order to help prevent that, there are a few steps which you can take to avoid sweating. Another thing you can't easily do with melt and pour is apply color swirling techniques, like in cold process soap. And that is because melt and pour is more liquid in texture and the colors easily blend. So let's get started by creating our own mold. When you start using melt and pour, you obviously need a mold to melt and pour soap into. The easiest and the most convenient way is to buy one, as there are hundreds if not thousands of molds available online. But in this course, we are going to learn how to make our own mold from nothing more than just an idea on paper. Start by imagining your soap bar and drawing out its dimensions using a ruler, a pen, and a blank A4 paper. This doesn't have to be final, just conceptual. For me, this is what I feel like a soap bar would feel great in my hand. One of the main reasons why you draw your soap bar beforehand is because you will have a signature soap bar size, which will stand out on the market. Now that we have our idea on paper, it is time to make the first concept of our soap bar to see how it would look and feel in our hands. There are three ways. The first is using wood boards, as these are available all around us. You can find them anywhere, from broken shelves, offcuts, or simply can just order them online brand new. However, be prepared to experience some difficulty as they are hard to handle. Another one is using foam boards. These are easy to handle and come in various thicknesses. A thickness I would recommend is anything above two centimeters. Please do make sure you also use a knife blade and that you are extra careful. The third way and the method which we will be using in this tutorial will be traditional building blocks. You can purchase these online and it will be enough for one project to get you started. Remember that this will become easier as you progress. Now, as I am building the mold, I keep testing the size and feel of the soap bar and realize that I am not entirely happy with the drawing, but because I have building blocks, it is easy to change the size.
Now I feel that this is the right size I would like to go with. All that is left now is to build up my soap bar to make a loaf of maybe six to seven slices. And for me, this is just about the right length. Because we are using building blocks to build our mold, it is quite likely that silicone will leak through the holes, but to prevent this from happening, we will be using a transparent vinyl sheet of paper. It doesn't have to be transparent, it can be any color. Now, using a knife blade, carefully trim the vinyl and seal your model so that there won't be any empty spaces exposed between the bricks. Now that we have our model, it is time to make our casting chamber, and again, using building blocks and vinyl sheets to seal it. The whole process can take a while, but remember that once you finalize the first one, it is easy to build more and more molds with less and less hustle. With time, you will become cleaner and more productive. Making loaf molds from scratch is a business in itself. Sure, there are loaf molds available online, but it is way more attractive to make your own signature size. And I'm sure there are people who would prefer to buy fully customized loaf molds. Now that our model fits perfectly in here, with just enough clearance on the sides, it is time to move on to the sealing process. Vinyl is an excellent material for sealing the entire chamber from leaking. Not only that, but it is also easy to remove it while protecting your building blocks after you've done your casting. This is a meticulous job, so having music on helps you stay focused. Now to make sure there won't be any leaks, I will put both the model and the casting chamber on top of an A3 adhesive paper, which will help keep it on the ground and prevent the silicone from getting under and lift it. If you don't have an A3 adhesive paper, you can use paper glue on the model, a glue gun, or blue tack on the sides of the casting chamber anything that will prevent the silicone getting under. I am wrapping the A3 adhesive paper on the model and slowly trimming the edges. Now that we've done that, we are ready to pour our silicone over our model. Now that everything is sealed, we are ready to pour our silicone. This silicone has a mix ratio of 100 to 1.5, which means for 500 grams of silicone, I will need 7.5 grams of catalyst. The catalyst is what cures the silicone. I chose this silicone because it of its thickness and because it comes with a clear catalyst. It has a curing time of eight hours, so our mold will be ready tomorrow morning. Keep in mind that if you are doing this in a hot room or during summer, the cure is accelerated, meaning that instead of eight hours, you would need somewhere around four to five. I got this kit on eBay for 32 pounds, 99 pence for two kilograms, which I think is cheap for that quantity. As for quality, I have used this before, and I am very happy as it has a great tensile strength. If you do have an accident and cause spillage, don't bother wiping it up, let it dry you can easily remove it after it cures. When you do pour the silicone, please make sure you do it from a high distance to eliminate the air bubbles. To find out the correct ratio of silicone you would need, you can fill up the casting chamber with rice, but as a matter of preference, I chose to mix another batch, just in case there are any leaks. For this particular mold, I will make the walls thin so that I can also make a personalized chamber out of resin.
After five hours, our mold is ready. The temperature in the kitchen was 23 degrees, so this definitely helped in curing. Now I will get my knife blade ready and start taking the casting chamber apart. I will start with the surrounding paper, and I will quickly speed this up because it took me around 20 minutes to finalize it. This is great, because I've only consumed 200 grams of silicone for the mold. However, the walls are not thick enough, so the mold cannot support itself. Now we need to make a mold chamber to support our mold. Our chamber is now sealed, and it is time to mix our resin. The resin I will be using is purchased from Amazon. The price and quality looked very good. The mix ratio is easy, 2 to 1. For example, 100 grams part A to 50 grams part B. As for the color, you can use any mica or pigment you would like. For my chamber I will choose black, and so I will be using activated charcoal. The curing time for this resin is around 12 hours, but we have to do it in batches because there is a rule that applies better wide and flat than high and narrow. And we will be doing high and narrow, so we have to do it in two batches. The resin will cause a chemical reaction after one hour, and heat will be released, and that's when the resin will partially harden, so please take extra care. After pouring the first batch, I will wait around three hours, and then pour the second batch, while gently eliminating air bubbles using our mixing spatula. Now that our resin has cured, it is time to get the building blocks out. This will be a bit difficult, so please arm yourself with a bit of patience. It would be wonderful if you have a scraper to help separate the hard resin from the building blocks, as it will make it far easier on your hands. Remember that you only have to do this the first time for this project. If you cast another chamber, it will be out of silicone, and the hard resin will come out in 20 seconds. The surface looks rough and messy, but we will take care of that in the next video. Even if this is for our personal use, I would still like to give it a more stylish and pleasant feel. But before we do that, we need to eliminate the paper as much as we can, so that we can stick our vinyl onto it. We do this by gently rubbing fairy liquid with a metal sponge and warm water. It doesn't have to be perfect, as we will wrap it in vinyl, but the surfaces have to be even so that we don't get air bubbles. Remember, this could have been avoided if I had enough vinyl sheets instead of using adhesive paper. You can now see that our final product is starting to come together. As a final step, we now need to take measurements in order for us to print the right size of the logo onto the vinyl sheets. So we have 23 centimeters in length, 9 centimeters in height, and 7.2 centimeters in width. Here we have our vinyl sheets. Gently stick the paper onto the mold on all sides, eliminating air bubbles, and carefully trim the excess vinyl with a knife blade.
Once this is done, insert your silicone mold inside and there we have it, our own personal loaf mold, fully customized and 100% handmade from scratch. If you got to this stage, congratulations. Now that we have made our mold, it is time to make our melt and pour. If you enjoy the course so far, please consider subscribing and giving the video a thumbs up so that more aspiring soap makers can watch too. We are going to take a pretty basic baking approach. We are going to separate our dry ingredients from our wet ingredients. We only need five main ingredients plus our lye mixture to bind them all together. Please wear gloves, a mask, and goggles. If you don't have goggles, make sure you are in a very well-ventilated area. If you are doing this on your stove, turn the extraction on to max. So let's start with our ingredients. First, we need vegetable glycerin, monopropylene glycol, sodium C14, sodium hydroxide, lye, mysteric acid, and stearic acid. As for materials, we require a metal jug, a scale, a glass jug, a thermometer, infrared or normal, and a pot to cook our melt and pour. First, we will start off by making our lye solution and leaving it aside. This is very dangerous, so please take extra care in doing it. We will be making the lye solution in the metal jug. First, weigh the water from the recipe, which in this case is 45 grams, and carefully measure the sodium hydroxide separately in a different container the same amount, 45 grams. Now add the sodium hydroxide to the jug where you have the water measured, never the other way around. Do this in a safe environment, either outside or in an isolated area, while wearing your mask. After you've done this, gently stir it, making sure you don't splash around. You can use a metal spatula, or just gently shake the jug around until it is fully dissolved. Leave the lye mixture in a safe area. If you enjoy the course so far, please consider subscribing and giving the video a thumbs up so that more aspiring soap makers can watch too. So we have here our recipe, describing the steps we have to take in order to achieve a transparent melt and pour base. The recipe is available to download and print down in the video description. Now it's time to start cooking our melt and pour. We will start by mixing our dry ingredients in a big jar or bowl. Weigh in 200 grams of stearic acid. It's okay if you have slight errors. Don't worry too much about it, as it won't make a significant difference in the end product. Reset the scale, and pour 90 grams of mysteric acid. Now do a gentle stir of both dry ingredients, and leave them aside. Bring your pot next to you, and start measuring your wet ingredients. The order doesn't matter. I will start with 450 grams of sodium C14, followed by 300 grams of monopropylene glycol, and 100 grams of vegetable glycerin. Mix all the liquids together and get your thermometer ready. Don't worry about the air bubbles. I am using an induction cooker, but a hob with flame will work best as heat can be controlled better. Start by heating the liquids to a temperature of 60 degrees Celsius or 140 Fahrenheit using low to medium heat while stirring occasionally. Once the mixture has reached an overall 60 degrees, pour in the dry ingredients and continue stirring. Gently control your heat and keep your soap around 60 degrees for about 10 to 15 minutes. My thermometer acts funny sometimes, but it still does the job well. Slowly raise the heat and keep the mix at around 65 to 75 degrees for like five minutes. Gently pour the lye mix and slowly stir the mixture. The mixture will now become slightly thicker, 
and the temperature will increase to 90 degrees. Do not let your mix reach 100 degrees and boil, otherwise your soap will turn cloudy. Keep stirring and keep the temperature steady around 90 degrees for approximately 5 minutes. The mix will slowly become thinner and thinner. Now the mix will turn into soap, so turn your heat off and leave it resting on the stove. The reason why I will not pour it in a mold is that the lye is still active in the mix and it will distort the silicone. Congratulations, you have just made your own melt and pour base. Now it is time to test its texture, transparency, foaming, fragrance and color holding. As you can see, our soap has hardened already and it is ready for us to take a sample. At first glance, the texture feels smooth, and I can feel a slight film of glycerin on my hands, which is great. The transparency also looks good. I can almost see through it. Now let's remove our soap from the pot and do a test melt to check our other marks. We can see the transparency is actually great, and I encounter an even resistance when I try to slice it, which is how it needs to be. I'm going to cut a few blocks and melt them in our double boiler, starting with cold water and a high heat, so that I can gradually bring our water to boil. Now I am going to pour a clean, transparent layer in which I have added a tiny amount of lemon essential oil. This should cloud the soap a little. We will leave that layer to cool down whilst we begin to melt another layer. Now that our second layer is ready, I would normally use alcohol to bind the layers together, but in this case, I would like to see how well our hot soap binds to the cold layer without the alcohol. As for the color, I will use a light blue. I will leave the second layer to cool down and continue to melt and pour my third and last layer with a touch of bright green. Our soap is finally ready for our last test. Now that we have unmolded our soap, we can see that it maintains a great transparency as well as a great adhesion between layers, while also having a slight resistance to liquid coloring bleeding, which means our colored layers, blue and green, have not yet mixed. So let's take a slice and see how well it foams in cold water. If it foams well in cold water, it means it will foam really well in warm water. So it does create a nice lather in cold water, foams well, and my hands feel great too. It is also really nice, as you can see through because of its transparency. I would say that we've done a nice job overall, and we should be happy with our melt and pour. If you have made it this far, well done. If you haven't, not a problem. Have a break and start again. Remember, practice makes perfect. If you enjoy the course so far, please consider subscribing and giving the video a thumbs up so that more aspiring soap makers can watch too. Now that we have our melt and pour done, let's have a look at the types of colorants we can use. There are basically two major types of colorants, solids and liquids. We will start with the solids. Solid colorants have several advantages over liquid colorants. They can increase the thickness of the soap, and they do not mix. That means that the colors will not bleed into each other and cause the soap to become one color. 
This is because they color the soap using particles rather than liquids. Particles are slow moving. So naturally, they will want to stay separated, especially when layered. Solid colorants are composed of powder-based colorants, such as food colorants, mica, pastes, or titanium dioxide. Powder-based colorants are usually derived from ground turmeric, spinach, beetroot, red amaranth, and so on. They will give a rich and pastel-like hue to the soap, making the soap perfect to use as a natural scrub. Another solid colorant is mica, and this is probably the most popular on the market. However, unlike food colorants, mica does not increase the thickness of the soap. Mica particles are very light, and because it is a mineral, it has a shiny, glimmering appearance, which can make the soap look very attractive. We have here two powder-based colorants. One is turmeric, the other one is green tea. I will split 100 grams of melt and pour into two parts. When we mix in one teaspoon of turmeric powder, you can already see how the thickness of the soap is increased, while giving the soap a rich, dark yellow appearance. And as we mix in the green tea powder, you can see the exact same effect and the same change in thickness. After we pour the turmeric powder-colored soap, you can still see that there is steam coming out which indicates that the soap is still hot, yet it has become thicker. I will now pour the green tea soap right in and you will see that, although they look like they have been mixed and became one color, you will soon be able to easily distinguish the colors. Now I am going to finish our soap by pouring another layer of clear melt and pour so that this can give it an earthy-like appearance. You can now see that although colors were poured in together, they have not mixed, and there is no sign of bleeding on the clear layer. Powder-based colorants are an excellent choice if you are making natural soap bars as your main selling point, as these natural colorants have a great range of benefits for our skin. Our second solid type colorant is perhaps the most popular in soap making. Mica is a mineral we will use to color our melt and pour. But unlike our powder-based food colorants, mica does not increase thickness, mainly because the particles are much finer than powder-based colorants, so much so that they will easily float in the air meaning that they can be a bit dangerous if mishandled. Mica powder has to be handled slowly, mixed slowly, and the area has to be well ventilated. A similar advantage when it comes to coloring is that just like powder-based colorants, mica does not bleed. This makes it an excellent type of colorant if you would like to achieve various advanced designs. I will start by adding one teaspoon of wine red mica on the left and some sky blue mica on the right. I am going to mix the wine red mica with the clear soap and start by pouring the first layer. One thing about mica is that if not mixed well, it will create lumps, which are not very pleasant. So always mix the mica in while you are melting the soap. Now I will move on to the sky blue mica and give it a nice stir. As you can see, the soap is much thinner than when the powder colorants were used. As I pour my second layer into the first layer, you can immediately see how a separation starts happening, and the two layers attempt to separate from each other. However, I will add a third layer of clear soap, which will cause a further separation of the two colors. We can now see that even though the colors were mixed, they have maintained a perfect barrier between each other and there is no sign of bleeding between the colors. Mica-based colorants are an excellent choice if you are looking to achieve advanced, eye-catching designs. Looks are the main point of sale for a soap that is made with mica due to its glittery, shiny, and bright appearance. If you enjoy the course so far, please consider subscribing and giving the video a thumbs up so that more aspiring soap makers can watch too. 
The second major type of colorants for melt and pour are composed of liquids. Liquid colorants spread into of two types, liquid dyes and glycerin based. The first type we are going to look at will be liquid dyes. Liquid dyes are probably the most affordable type of colorants you can get for your melt and pour. They provide that lovely transparency and see-through effect. This is the type of colorant we use to test our melt and pours transparency. Liquid dyes have one downside though. Since the colors are water-based, they will easily blend. So even if you are layering the colors, they will ultimately bleed into each other. I would like to make a green, so we'll choose yellow and blue for our soap. You can easily control the amount you are going to use. Liquid dyes immediately color the soap with just a few drops, and they mix very easily. After I pour my first yellow soap, I will follow up with the blue soap so that you can see how easily the colors blend with each other. If we now have a look, the soap has immediately turned into a gradient green, and it will continue to turn even more over time, regardless whether we layer it or not. Liquid dyes are the best choice for single-colored soaps, especially if you are using floral enhancements, as the ingredients can be seen through in an attractive hue. Glycerin-based colorants are basically an improved version of the liquid dyes, and as the name implies, these colorants are based on glycerin. One major advantage that these colorants have over liquid dyes is that the colors don't bleed into each other, yet they provide an excellent transparency. We have here two colors, red and blue, and 100 grams of soap divided into two containers. If we were to use red and blue liquid dyes, we would get a violet towards purple. As you can see, unlike the liquid dyes, the glycerin colors won't disperse, remaining still at the bottom until mixed. Glycerin colors are stronger than liquid dyes and require a longer mix as they have a thicker texture. As you can see, when we pour the two together and attempt to mix them, we won't get a violet or a purple. The colors will stay separated. Even though they were poured in together at a high temperature, there is no sign of color bleeding. Glycerin-based colorants are excellent for layering various colors while also maintaining transparency, and this is a strong point of sale for those who would like to achieve different eye-catching bespoke designs. Mixing your own liquid colors can be fun, as there are three primary colors, red, yellow, and blue. Everything else is derived from these three, with the exception of black and white, which can brighten and darken and help achieve different hues. However, when it comes to solid colorants, mica in particular, manufacturers literally have dozens of color varieties, such as emerald green, metallic green, grass green, and so on. It really helps knowing how your coloring would affect your end product, as different bases of melt and pour react differently to colors. Transparent bases generate very strong colors with little amount needed, while opaque bases usually requires a larger amount to obtain stronger shades. There are two ways you can simplify a large collection of mica, and that is by making your own colored blocks and oils. This also helps you stay safe from inhaling or mishandling the mica powder. Making colored soap blocks is a business in itself, as the most popular packs of mica come in 5G bags, Mica powder have very fine particles, which can easily float in the air and make their way into our lungs. Start by melting 100 grams of soap and mix with 5 grams of mica. This will help us work safer with mica and discover the shade of color we are working with. Use alcohol to eliminate the air bubbles. After your colored block is hardened, start slicing it into tinier blocks. It doesn't have to be even, but a 10 grams tiny block of mica will evenly color one kilogram of melt and pour. Continue slicing our 10 grams block of mica into even tinier pieces and throw them in a hot melt and pour while continuing to stir evenly until fully dissolved. When ready, start by pouring your soap into a mold and let it cure at room temperature. The loaf mold we made earlier holds exactly one kilogram of soap, which is great.
Now, as you can see, our tiny block has evenly colored our whole block of melt and pour. Let's have a quick look at where coloring is important and how we can use it. When the two types are compared, we can clearly see that coloring plays an important role in defining our end product. If we look at making a soap as natural as possible as its main point of sale, then our coloring would be simple. Both liquid dyes or powdered colorants would work, which would also go really well to have herbal enhancements added. Eco packaging would play a similar important role, but not as much because the usage benefits would be the main point of sale of the soap. When we talk about usage benefits, we talk about ingredients that fight stretch marks, acnes, pimples, black spots, and so on. Examples of enhancements that we can use in melt and pour when going for a natural product are oats, seeds and kernels, herbs and flowers, carrier oils, milk, dry fruits or fresh fruit, honey or gels, Packaging plays a very important role here. It can literally make or break a product. There are three popular ways you can wrap your soap. Paper, plastic, and card. They all have various advantages and disadvantages. When you make beautifully layered soaps, you want people to see them, so the best choice would be to use shrink wrap. This type of packaging keeps your cost low, while also allowing you to see through the packaging. On the other hand, we have paper wrap. Paper is easy to spoil, though, but it gives that luxury feeling which heavily improves your product's image. Paper wrap is excellent for soaps that don't focus on looks, but have a lot of skin benefits. To protect the paper from soap sweating effect, you need to have another layer of paper wrapped around your soap. Double wrapping your soap can be time consuming, but it will help protect your outer packaging design while they stay on shelves. Another way of wrapping your soap is using cardstock. This is very popular with cold process soaps as it offers a bit of both worlds. However, when used on melt and pour, it attracts moisture, causing the card to spoil and become soft. One way to avoid this is by making sure the card doesn't stay wrapped around your soap for too long. Wrapping your soap and card is very fast, and it has a low cost, making it an excellent choice to wrap your soaps by order. If you enjoy the course so far, please consider subscribing and giving the video a thumbs up so that more aspiring soap makers can watch too. Besides soap bars, melt and pour can also be used to make frosting and bath bomb decorations. Frosting is difficult to master at first, but it gets easy once you have done it a few times. You know the old say, practice makes perfect. In order to create frosting, you need to force air into the soap. If you have ever done icing, it is a similar process. To do soap frosting, you first need a hand blender. Start by adding 50 grams of foaming bath butter, 25 grams of unrefined coconut oil, and 20 grams of white melt and pour. Put all the ingredients together in a bowl and slowly start melting them using a double boiling method at a low heat. Try not to let the ingredients melt completely. Take them off the heat and start blending the small chunks once you have some liquid to work it. Keep blending the mixture. You will soon discover that as you keep doing it, it will start becoming thicker and thicker. At this stage, if you would like to modify the consistency, you can continue to add more coconut oil and bath butter to make it more liquid. However, I will keep my consistency at this level. Nothing mandatory, just preference. Once the frosting is done, you can see the consistency is similar to a cream. Now we can grab a piping bag and add the frosting in. Now that our frosting is ready, I will take a regular bath bomb I made earlier and add it on top. I am using quite a big piping bag for a small quantity, so air got trapped in inside the bag. I am going to layer a good amount and then fluff the frosting using a spatula, giving it a nice spiky feel. Once I am happy with the fluff, 
I will sprinkle some green tea powder colorant we used earlier and a tiny speck of bath bomb dust. Now I am going to take a small block of purple soap and melt it. Once that is done, I will slowly pour it on the top, giving our bath bomb a nice overflow effect. We will now let the frosting to harden at room temperature. If you want faster results, you can put it in the fridge or someplace where a cooler temperature is present. Now that our frosting is hard, it can be easily packaged and stored. Besides frosting, melt and pour can also be used on its own to decorate bath bombs. I have here some leftover purple soap from earlier, and I would like to give this bath bomb a nice jewelry looking effect. To do so, I will pour the soap in a different container, dip the bath bomb in, and then immediately dip it in our dead sea salt, after which I will pour the rest of the soap over the top. Congratulations, we've now reached the end of this course. You now have all the information you need to begin your soap making journey using Melt and Pour. We've touched some pretty important points from coloring to packaging to different ways we can use our Melt and Pour and went all the way from an idea on paper to our very own first soap bar. If you enjoyed this course, please consider subscribing to this channel and stay up to date with new recipes and more courses. Thank you for watching and see you soon.